Hash, oil, dab, BHO, rosin. These terms get thrown around a lot. From dispensary counters to national newsrooms, there's a lot of questions being raised about cannabis concentrates. One part art, one part science, the sticky amber oil has a culture all its own. I'm off to explore how it's made and why many consider these forms to be the future of cannabis. I'm Roxy Stryer, and this is The Art of Extraction. Washington, the evergreen state. Rain, the space needle, and legal cannabis. That's all I really knew before starting this journey. As a medical marijuana patient in California, I could tell you the difference between indica and sativa. I'd seen wax and chatter at my local dispensary and puffed on a vape pen, but I couldn't really tell you anything about concentrates other than my cousins love to dab. Olium is a team of lively, passionate cannabis extractors who create a full rainbow of concentrates. Hi, I'm Roxy. I'm Graham Jennings. I'm the owner of Olium Extracts. Graham is a bit of a jokester, but I was most impressed with the pride he takes in their extracts and hands-on approach. So I feel like I'm at the coolest buffet that ever took place. What am I looking at here? So basically you're looking at a, a wide assortment of uh, extractions that only extracts produces. So talk me through each one then. So this oh, wow. is white fire and it's got like a honeycomb, kind of sugary consistency. Oh, it's kind of gritty. So it had so much THCA, it started developing sugar glands. They started crystallizing in the extraction. And so the next process we would go to would be like the live resin. That's really popular right now. A lot of people either freeze their plant into like sub-zero freezing conditions, and then they quickly run the material through the material column. So they'll pack it frozen in there and then run it. It's probably gonna test anywhere from three to 5% on the terpenes, as this would be like 0.2 to 2% on the terpenes. And then this is Fire OG, and you can see the terpenes, they're so terpy that the terpenes have dripped down and collected after a couple days of just sitting there. This is probably gonna test upwards of 20% terpenes. Wow. And maybe 30%, 40% THC. All three of these though, they came right out of the machine, you blasted it out and you baked them and you left them. Yep, and the only reason why they're really clean and clear like this is because the grower initially did a good job and then we did a good job on our filtration and our extraction. And how much solvent is going in before you bake it? How, what percent? So usually we're right around 600 parts per million when we put it into the oven and we're trying to get down to 10 parts per million, which is considered solventless. So is that dangerous, Graham, in any kind of way to the consumer that there is whatever parts per million of the solvent left in the product? No, I think the Surgeon General uh, guidelines say 5,000 parts per million on a daily uh, basis is n not recommended to oversee that. So if we're at like 10 parts per million, I think it's pretty safe. So with any extraction process, we want to start with good starting material. And what we really look for is high THC count and resin. And for the most part, if it has that, we want to extract that. You're gonna want those. What are these for? Those are for your protection. Well, like it's dangerous? It could be. Seriously? No. So just to make us look cool then? Basically, we want to stay in compliance. We want to be, we want to be safe. What are at these all times. protecting me from? Well, we're in a hydrocarbon extraction room. Okay. And so basically, this vessel is a pressure vessel. We designed and fabricated these. They're rocket extractors. They're one of the first crude extractors on the market. Um, crude extractor, I mean, you can process more than five pounds. We do up to 40 pounds a run. The extraction process begins when they load the material into Oleum's custom-made rocket extractor. Once full, they run a blend of hydrocarbon gas through the cannabis. This is filled up with the hydrocarbon. So this has our special mix of propane, isobutane, intane, top secret stuff. And so- Ooh, it's top secret? Because people use different solvents? It, for every different material run, you can have a different solvent combination and a different solution that you like individual to run through your material. So once we run the hydrocarbons through the molecular sieve, it comes through here and then goes to the material column 
and then it comes down through here and then goes in the collection vessel. So today we put about 30 pounds of gases through and we're gonna collect that here. It's gonna go through the pumps and then at the heat exchanger, it's gonna recondense into liquid and come back and collect in the solvent tank. Okay. So we're ready to go? Yeah, I think so. All right, ready. So we're just gonna start it slow. So right now it's going from in here. Through here. Through there. Into here and through up through here. All right, so this is what we call the soft serve. And so actually we've recovered all of our hydrocarbons with our machine and now we're gonna blast it out of the bottom. So boom. So that's what we extracted. And you can see the white all the THC. So there's still going to be a, a little bit of residual hydrocarbons left, but for the most part, it's ready to put in the oven. Now this is where people would change their levels of pressure. They suck the vacuum to really high negative to low negative with different uh, temperature variations, and that would affect the consistency. So we might want shatter, we might want wax, we might want sugar, and that all has the variance of the way that I manipulate it in the oven. And oleum creates all of those different products. Yes. And this is the base for every product This is you the have. base for everything that we make. We start with this, we get this, and then this is how we refine it the next couple steps. Great, so let's go put it in the oven. Let's do it. Okay. So this is gonna be our sugar wax extraction. We know the quality of the product was really good from the beginning, and so we know the quality of the product coming out of the oven is gonna be really good. Is there any way you could butcher it? If it's a good product going in, could there be a bad product coming out? Yes, there could, and that all has to do with how you utilize your oven. And if you have it in there too long, you could bake off all the terpenes. If you have the temperature up too long, you could affect the consistency. There's all sorts of variables to these ovens to make it good or bad. So we put them in, we check on them, check on them a couple times, but that's pretty much it. And then when yeah. it's done, we pull out the end yeah. result? Yeah. Okay, so th I think there's one in here there that is. There is, let's check it out. All right. <clears throat> and it's down there at the bottom if you want to grab it. And you can see that it came out and all the hydrocarbons are extracted out of it. It's got all the little bubbles and it's solidified into like a hard sugar type of wax. And it's ready to smoke. I was excited for my first dab, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little nervous. I'd been offered one before, but the process seemed complicated, so I was thrilled to have a professional walk me through it. My advice for any newbies? Start small, take it slow. What do we have in front of us? So these are three different products that we've made at Oleum Extracts. Right here we have our live resin. This was a freshly trimmed, harvested crop, and it's got Tons of terpene profile, really high concentration of THC. Good essence, give it a smell. This is almost like a body scrub. Like it's got that inside yes. of it. It looks almost salty or something. Yeah, we call it sugarized, but yeah, crystallized in the process. So the other one is similar to like what we made today. It is a sugar wax, and you smell that one, it's a little different. And, that's and the, it's lighter in color, too. Yeah, that's the White Fire OG. That was a nug run, so it was full flower hand trimmed, and we just ran it fresh. So this one's a little drier, but still has the crystals in it. Yeah, and the reason why I call it sugar wax is because we haven't removed the waxes and lipids fully from that, yet we did filter it in the process to make it that clarity, but there still is wax and lipids present, so we call it a sugar wax. That one smells amazing. Yeah. And the other one we have is a distillate. We call this the lemon curd. It's more of an unrefined distillate, but it's got a lot of flavor. Does it take usually people one dab, two dabs? You can't really tell. Most people, it usually takes one dab, and we always say wait for a little while, about a half an hour at least, before you take another one. So let's try All this. All right, so let me get a little bit for you so we get the little beginner's dab. And you Beginner. Just want, yeah, you just want to start with like a rice size of a grain of rice, we say. So, <clears throat> about that much. Okay. And so. And this is already <laughs> heated up because of. This is heated up. And so we have this around a 620 degrees. Anything above that's gonna burn your capillaries and your lungs. 
And Is that's it, what you get the coughing and the <laughs> Exactly, it's gonna be more harsh too. Okay. All right, so you ready? Yeah. All right, so, so we'll start. talk me through it. So as soon as I start, you're gonna start sucking and I'm gonna put it on this heated okay. titanium nail. Mm -hmm. Start sucking and I'm gonna drop the cap on it. There you go, so you're probably good. <laughs> oh, that one's really lemony. In a good way, it tastes like a, like pledge. <laughs> but not that's, in a bad way. That's the lemon terpenes. Like in a very present. fresh kind of way. And which one of these do you prefer to use? The one I prefer to use is probably the sugar wax, just because I know what the product it came from and it tastes probably the best to me. Do you ever like make a cocktail? Like a little bit of this, a little yeah, bit it, of that? That's everybody's favorite thing to do, is you take a little bit of this and a little bit of that, you mix it up. It's giggly. Like, it, do some of these make you more giggly than others? Yeah, so this, these two actually that we just smoked are like hybrids, so they're gonna have a more like euphoric effect, and they're not gonna be so cerebral. You're gonna be super happy and there's gonna be like butterflies floating around. I feel those butterflies. You can always tell because I start to smile a lot, my cheeks start to hurt, and they get kind of rosy. So that's how I'm feeling. Graham, thank you so much for letting me try your product and for showing me around the entire lab. Of course, I had a great time. I'm glad you came for it. Thank you, thank you. Nice to meet you. You too. After spending the day with Graham at Oleum, I also learned that with enough refining, you can take lesser starting materials and end up with an incredible product. Most appealing to me were the distillates, especially the lemon curd. The light, lemony smell seemed the most refreshing of the bunch. The thing that stood out to me the most is that it's not just about the THC, it's about the TLC and how important it is to pay attention to the details. Denver, Colorado, the Mile High City. I've heard that since Colorado opened its doors to cannabis, it has served as ground zero for much of the innovation taking place in the industry. Now it's time to find out for myself. I hadn't heard much about CO2 extraction other than that's how they make vape pens. I wondered what CO2 could do that butane couldn't. Evolab is a blend of passion and research. They've taken traditional science and applied it to this rising industry. They're confident that CO2 is the best process for extracting cannabis. Hello. Hello. Hello, Roxy. How are you? I'm Alex. I'm okay. the CEO and founder of Evo Lab. Nice and this to meet is you, Alex. Dr. Stephen Bennett, our scientific director. Hello. Fox nice to meet you guys. I'm so excited for today. Alex, CEO of Evo Lab, a former cannabis grower, has shifted his focus from flower to concentrate. Well, first of all, we start with CO2. We use CO2 as our only extraction solvent here, which is a little bit different than most here in Colorado who are using propane and butane. CO2 historically was low yielding, low efficiency, um, and had bad flavor because of the manufacturers using CO2 or not using it properly. Um, but I believe we could make it right, and we're starting to see indications that not only is this scalable, but it's more efficient. Now that we have this proprietary terpene extraction technology, no question that better terpene profiles come from CO2, but we're just the only people that are currently able to capitalize on at that. At this level. Basically the process starts here, raw material, so it comes in this door essentially and we funnel it to one of three machines. Well in addition to being safer in the workplace and safer for consumers, we also have selectivity. So we can use CO2, different pressures and temperatures to grab different compounds, which we call fractionating. We have three separate vessels here to separate compounds, so we can use one parameter to pull terpenes, for instance, another parameter to pull the essential oils, and another parameter to pull all the real insoluble stuff like THCA, which is very difficult to pull off. So now we're separating the compounds before we get into secondary processing, as opposed to extracting them all into one sludge and then pulling from that. As we discuss the different types of fractions that we can take, this would be one of the fractions. Um, this is mostly wax and a lot of THCA. So as you can see, we still have residual water from the extraction process, a lot of wax. It smells strong. It is pretty strong, yeah. And from here, we have to go into some secondary processes. In this instance, we do what's called winterization. So winterization is where we take ethanol, alcohol, and we put this sludge product in the ethanol, 
when we put this in the freezer, we get a separation effect of the alcohol and the, and the fat and the wax. Um, once we get a good separation, we'll filter out the waxes and it'll come out looking just about like this. And then we'll take this filtered oil that's still suspended in alcohol over to the Rotovap. And this stuff ends up going in here. And this thing will start to turn in a heated bath and the heat and vacuum will then pull off the ethanol. And we end up then with a black oil. Dr. Steven, take it from here. Stephen holds a PhD in molecular biology and now is combining his passion for cannabis with his background in Alzheimer's research. When I think of concentrates, he's certainly not who I picture. The laboratory equipment looked more like a time machine than something used to make hash. So essentially, if you take the material that comes out of the rotary evaporator, the winterized oil, that's our starting material here. And we're basically taking off different fractions based on boiling point. So what we want to do ultimately is boil off the cannabinoids, the THC, the CBD. Our chroma is what's distilled off of the oil, so we end up with all of the chlorophyll on one side and basically this very clear sample of distillate on this side. This ranges uh, on a low end maybe 80% up to 95% cannabinoids, but this is what we're able to generate from here at a rate of about upwards of a kilogram um, an hour. And then what happens next? So you have that in the tub. So basically this is the base of, of our alchemy. Our alchemy then is going to be a strain specific so that the, the, the flavors come from the terpenes that we derive from CO2. We basically have a full uh, plant profile. All of the different you know, terpenes, which we'll see later, that Alex has. Um, you'll notice that one's lemon G, you'll notice that one's you know, ghost train haze, and very, very clear that they're strain specific. If you think about the raw flour, for instance, typically um, tests between 15 and 20% THC these days. What we like to call the fresh terps is basically the flour in oil form or in liquid form. Okay. Okay, so let's start with, um, this is um, a real fuely one. This is called Gorilla Glue. And I'll, I'll just hand them over to you. Are you supposed to waft or yeah, what? Yeah, just you can put your nose on okay. it, you'll smell it, yeah. And you can smell there'll be um, a very unique flavor. That one's a little gassier. In the cannabis culture, there's sort of the lemony stuff is really popular, and then what's really gassy is really popular. Those typically are your OG strains. And then this gives you, you know, your classic example of lemon. So this is lemon G, very, very popular because like I said, people really like um, the citrus, lemon, tangerine, lemonine flavors. Oh yeah, yeah. Is it kind of a little minty too? Yeah, I believe that's eucalyptol that you're smelling. Well, what we brought for you today, um, this is a dab rig with an e-nail, electric nail. And with an electric nail, we can control the temperature. Typically with terpenes, you want to use lower temperatures. So when we can tune it back to lower temperatures, we can ensure the positive experience. This is a great rig too. This is a good one for you to start with. So we'll start with the face off OG. We'll put a little drip on there for you. I feel like I gotta, I gotta put my hair back or something. <laughs> You're gonna, you tell me when. Okay, so I'm about to drop it right now. Ready? Mm -hmm. Go. Harder. There you go. Keep going. Then you can clear that out. You yep. clear it out. Uh -huh. Well, I have so many other ones to try. Okay, let me check it. Oh, that was good. It was Tasty. smooth. Yeah. yeah, it was just a little. I just did a little bit. So do you think I should have done more? Um, little by little. Little by little. It tastes. Kind of like after you put uh, like Listerine in your mouth and you have that like feeling where it's kind of cold. It kind of tastes like cold. A little cold, okay. Does that make sense yep. at all? No, I, I, it's the probably the terpene like eucalyptol or something along those lines yeah. um, that you would find in mints and so forth. Do you still have things to learn? Because I feel like I've learned so much and I, I'm just at the beginning, but you're somebody who I feel like knows everything when it comes to cannabis. I wish. There's so much more to know. We're just really hitting the tip of the iceberg here. Um, we know we have a really good start. We have, um, you know, states and marketplaces where we can sell product, grow product, get better, master our craft, even though it's federally illegal. Um, and there are some limitations to that. One thing that we can do is really uh, move forward on expanding our technology and our knowledge of extracting the plant and how it affects people because it's out there. It's in people's hands and people are every day in their labs um, extracting and learning more.
Evo's fresh terps had a very happy and heady effect. It helped my slight stomach ache subside, but my cheeks began to hurt from smiling. After spending the day with the team at Evo, I realized that this really is a combination of science and passion. Phoenix, Arizona, the Valley of the Sun, sure lives up to its name. While it's not immediately known for cannabis, there is a lot of progress taking place. Vape and Clear is on the cutting edge of extraction. They focus all their energy on creating one great product, the Vape and Clear Distillate, that can be used in a number of ways. Hi, I'm Roxy. Hey, I'm Roman with Vape and Clear. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Roman, the energetic sales manager of Vape and Clear, oversees product development and relationships with various cannabis companies. So here we have where it all begins. So you grow all of your own product yourself? Exactly. To produce the best end product, we have to start with the best beginning products. And that's the most important thing is a clean, potent product. That's what we're all about. After Roman showed me the grow, I went to meet Blake in the extraction room. Hi, I'm Blake. Blake gets to do all of the amazing hands-on work during the extraction. So what is this? So this would be called the crudinator. Okay, why the crudinator? Well, the crudinator uh, basically extracts all the starting material to make crude, which is the starting uh, material for distillate. The extraction process didn't seem too different from anything I'd seen at the other labs, but I got to test my previous knowledge by getting my hands dirty. Now that we have gone through recovery, now we're just left with the crude oil, which is- At the, the bottom. bottom. Yes, at the bottom. So we're gonna pull this off. How can I help? Uh, if you want, you can run this. Okay. Can you reach it? Yeah. Okay. I'm tall. Fun part is now. Pull it up. Ah! Ooh. Keep pulling it up. Okay. Keep pulling it up. All right, you're good. You're good. You're good. No? Wow. So this is the crude oil. So what do you do with this? We're going to dump this into the ethanol, and that's going to cause this product to go into winterization. Oh, my God. All right. OK. OK. Good day to wear white pants. Right? Perfect day. Now what? Now you have to put your hands in there and break it all up into the ethanol. With your hands? Yep, with are your you, hands. Are you hazing me or is this what you really do? No, this is what you really do. Okay. All the way in. It's freezing. Yes, it is. Why is it so cold? Uh, just because the ethanol is cold. Why am I breaking this up? Well, the reason you break it up is so it gives it more surface area within the ethanol to start to winterize. You actually have to get it really cold to start the winterization. After this, you would stick that bucket, once it's all broken down, into a deep freezer for 24 hours, pull it out, and then start the filtering process. Cool! After the extraction was complete, Blake introduced me to Michael, who is ready to show me the distillation process. What we're going to do today is we're going to winterize and de-wax. So we take this bucket and we're going to dump it into these things, and then this is going to filter out the fat. This will filter the rest of the And we're going to get the good stuff in there. Yep, that's correct. Why do we have to get all the fat out? We don't want any impurities in the products. We want to make sure we get the cleanest product we can. OK, so how much do I want in here? Uh, about halfway is good. That's, that's perfect. That's good? Yep. Um, and I just want to tilt the, the front end in. OK. There you go. And then faster, faster. Faster? There you go. Perfect. Good? Yeah. And then you'll hear that vacuum pull it. So the first pass gets all the big fats out of there. Um, the second pass gets the next biggest size out, and the third, fourth passes we use a finer filter paper, and that gets a lot of the small, really nasty particles out of there. How different did this look when it was going through the first pass? Oh, it's really fatty. If you can imagine a tub of lard, that's pretty much what it looks like. Wow! <laughs> All right, so what's next then? Uh, so after that, we will actually take that product, and we'll put it into what we call a rotovape, if you want to walk over this yeah. way. Uh, what this machine does is it takes out all the alcohol that we use during our filtration. We'll take our liquid and we'll actually open this up here and we'll add it oh. in. 
So now it's going to add the little bit. It. Yep, yep, because it's under back, so. It's suctioning from here and it's going through to this globe looking thing. So why is it rotating like this? Then? What it does is it rotates to evenly distribute the heat. So when this is done, you would take off this sphere. Yep, then we would dump it all into a beaker. And then from the beaker, we'll go into our distillate machine. So we'll take this and we'll pour it up on the top. This is a final pass now. We've taken out most of the alcohol, if not all of it, within the first two passes. So right now it's just running by itself, mostly CBN, CBD, and THC. And it's dripping through and doing what? It will isolate, depending on our settings, what we would like on this side, and all the waste on this side. So this is as pure THC as we can figure out to get at the moment? At the moment, yes. So what percentage of THC usually would that be? Uh, with ours, it's, it's typically in the low to mid-90s, and then with an overall cannabinoid content of 99 and up. Okay, so now that you've uh, seen the process, I'm going to pass you back on over to Roman, and you guys can take a look at the, some of the final products. Great, thank you, Michael. All right, yeah, of course. Talk to me about the kind of products you guys make. Well, we all started with the vaping clear. And all you see here is cannabinoids and terpenes. What percentage is what in this? So, 99% roughly, uh, percent cannabinoids. Wow, how do they know they're not gonna consume too much? The whole industry has an issue with dosing. So we wanted to use this, to use the one product we know we can keep consistent time and time again over and over. And we brought it to an inhaler. So we have our vape and clear inhalers, which dose 10 milligrams per puff. So it's a legitimate inhaler. Everything you see about this inhaler is the same from a albuterol inhaler or an asthma inhaler as you would get from a doctor. Click it till it sprays once. There you go. So that was 10 <laughs> milligrams. Wow, I didn't want to waste it. Nah, you, there should be over, or 100 puffs exactly, you might actually get 101 out of this. And all you gotta do is shake it, exhale, and inhale. What would be the difference between one puff of the inhaler or one puff of this? Well, it's different. You can't dose one puff of this. But this isn't based on how hard you inhale. This is based this is on... This is metered dose. So every single puff is guaranteed to be the same. So just for clarification again, all of your product is the exact same vape and clear. It is all this. This is the throwback. This is what we all started off of, which is the vape and clear. I think we're gonna use this dabber from Smoke Cartel. So what is it? It looks like a pencil. This is a pencil dabber. Uh, really cool. This is all glass, so you can put it on a very hot element. It's not gonna catch fire. It's not gonna write anything. So you are legitimately gonna put that onto the tip of this? You are. I'm gonna do it. You're gonna do this. So you're gonna hold this syringe. You're gonna hold the pencil. Yeah. And I would say hold them in opposite hands. Now, you're gonna go ahead and apply by the size of a grain of rice from the syringe onto your dabber. Perfect, there's a full grain of rice. All right. Everyone's different on what they should be dosing, but it's super easy. All you do is apply. And that's all you need. Roman, thank you so much for everything today. Yeah, thank you so much for coming out and trying some of our products and having fun. The coolest part about my day at Vape & Clear was that while they make only one type of extract, they found a multitude of ways for us to consume it. I was amazed to learn how intricate and labor-intensive purifying cannabis can be. It was raining when I arrived back in Washington. This time we're headed north to visit Pioneer Nuggets and learn more about solventless extraction and this rosin thing people are talking about. The rosin process is fairly simple. You use heat and pressure to squeeze out the essential oils and then collect your extract. Due to rosin's low yields, it can be tedious, but the results are almost immediate. Originally from Louisiana, Pioneer Nuggets founder, Fitz, is a free-spirited fish fan. 
Welcome to the nursery. This is where life begins. His humble approach empowers his employees to try new things and take risks. So, Rosin, tell me a little bit about it for the people that don't know. Well, what rosin is, it's a new, you know, it's another form of concentrate made with just using heat and pressure. Um, so it's a real simple, uh, kind of all-natural extraction method uh, that sort of got discovered by people doing it at their house with a hair straightener. And so we built a little bit bigger machine to see if we can squeeze larger amounts of rosin out of some of our leftover nugs in a uh, trim. When you say a hair straightener, you literally mean a hair straightener. Yeah, I've never actually seen it done like that, but uh, that's how these guys were doing it for a long time. They were just taking a hair straightener and squeezing their nugs. And, uh, and, and messing up their hair straighteners. And messing up their girlfriend's hair straightener. So now both of us are pissed about it. <laughs> that makes sense to well, me. Now I'm happy. Okay, so it's been working out well for you then, I guess. It's, it's an art, so it takes about five minutes to learn and a lifetime to master. And we're just trying to find a balance between having some good material that we grow in-house and turn it into uh, good oil for everybody. Why would we do something like this instead of, I don't know, extracting through a CO2 extraction process or butane, propane? It's just a different way to do it. You know, those machines are closed systems. They, uh, they can handle a lot of material at once. With this method, it's a little more simple. But, you know, it's just an all-natural way to do the same thing. Well, I would love to see how hands-on this rosin process actually is. I think that you were going to show us to the freezer. Yeah, let's take a look at where the material comes from, and then we'll come back and see how the machine works. It's as simple as just a drop freezer. Okay. Got some uh, pouches pre-made that he makes and then puts back in the freezer. And then all of the frozen nugs and material right here, so we'll grab some of that out, too. Bunch of Snoop's dream. Nice. Thank Hello you. again. Aloha. <laughs> Ethan could endearingly be described as a cannabis nerd. His passion and intelligence when it comes to the plant truly sets him apart. Okay, so this is what we start with, then you turn it into these, and then we put it in the freezer, and this is what comes out. Yes. Cool. I have it come off the trim table and get froze, so all the water molecules in there go back to a crystal form of ice crystals allowing it to heat back up quicker and also keep the trichomes in a better state so they don't oxidize as quickly. So why do we want it to be able to heat up quicker? Why is that important? Well, I want it to reach its stage of viscosity faster so it can flow quicker so it can cool down quicker. The longer time it spends under heat, it'll decarboxylate and you'll get a lower grade product. Forgive me if this is a silly question, but why are we putting it in bags? Well, by putting it in the bag, it allows it to hold all the material together and lets the oil escape through the bag and get away from the trim. So there's less plant material that can escape and get around. Okay, cool. So let's check it out then. I have a piece of parchment folded in here and I will take a singular pouch and I'll put it in. I will apply pressure to it and I will slowly watch as the oil starts to seep away. Am I correct in saying this is pretty hot right now? I it's like about 200 degrees. By having the heat, it allows the trichome to go from its more crystalline state to a viscous state, so it flows. Why do we pick 200 degrees? Why not hotter than that? Hotter will start to decarb more as you press, so I want to run at a lower temperature. All right, so how do we, how do we run this baby? Well, generally to operate it, you apply pressure with the travel arm, and then once you reach where you have some pressure, you slowly increase pressure through air. Is it moving? Yes, it is. Uh-oh. That just slides right back in. OK. <laughs> Making pop, breaking things. <laughs> Keep going? All right, that should be good. And I'll operate it from here with the air. How long does this whole process usually take? It can take from a minute to about two minutes, depending on strain and what I'm pressing. And how much product will this yield? Well, in there I put about 40 grams, so I, if it maintains the 10% yield that I've been getting with this specific process, I should have 4 grams of oil on this sheet of parchment by the time I'm done, or around 4 grams. Oh, and, I'm starting to see it. Yep. I can smell it as it comes out. Mm -hmm. And as you see, I did have a bit of a blow up, but most of the oil flowed out in this direction. So this is actually an end product. Yeah, you can take that right now and use it. So I'm going to actually get to try some of this product later. Any recommendations of which strain is best with rosin? Well, my favorite is blueberry silver tip, mostly because I like the color it comes out and the flavor that I get from it. Okay. But that's also a favorite strain on a flower.
Well, first let's uh, open up this lavender. Take a look at that one. To me, that smells, I mean, it smells like lavender. It smells very floral. It's yeah. very floral, yeah. okay. If you really spend time looking at the terpene results and smelling stuff, you can learn a lot about why you're smelling what you're smelling. You know, you're gonna see pinene and limonene, and these are flavors that people like. And uh, the strains that have better mixes of those flavors seem to be the ones that consumers enjoy the most. This is Acapulco Gold. It's sweet but earthy, mm -hmm. not as floral. If this you... smells more like the plant to me, though. Right. Than that one does. All right, now we'll try the blueberry silver tip, which will be a completely different smell. You should get a little bit more of that floral smell, but with a blue with with blueberry assigned to it. But blueberry, like blueberries out of the garden, legitimately, it's gonna smell like blueberries. Let's try. It smells spicy, like it, a, like a spicy tree. I think it smells very similar to. Uh... To, to the, the earthy one? To the, the aquapogo, aquapogo yeah. One. It does, it smells, the aquapogo but, but when you smells. But smell them back to back and smell how different they are. Well, based on the way they smell, which one do you want to try? The, definitely the, the blueberry. Okay. I like that one. And it's better, you know, when you're starting out, it's better to go small than too big. And if you want to do two small ones, that's fine. A lot of times I think people take too big of dabs at first because they're trying to recreate the same sensation in their lungs that they typically get from smoking and that's, oh. that's not really going to happen. You're going to find that uh, the flavor hits a little stronger and stays a little longer and then the sensation is going to last longer than uh, your typical smoking experience. Okay, did I do it? Yeah, that's a good one to start out with. It's small, but you know, it's a good way to... I'm small! <laughs> Everybody's always saying, it's small. I'm small. <laughs> small it's huge. Picture. It's way too big. It's massive. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do it. Go for it. You can't really mess up. Swipe it, and then get that cap on there. Once you have it in there. Yeah, and then that'll... See the way the pressure allows it to kind of finish cooking off? And it's cooking on the nail while you're hitting it. It's a nice, nice dab without overdoing <laughs> it. Well, did you taste blueberries with hints of flower and sage? Sage, yeah. I taste. I find that about the blueberry silver tip as well. Let me ask you this, could you tell the difference uh, between a rosin dab and a BHO dab or, or one of the dabs you've had before? Do you find that this has more of a true cannabis flavor? I think that this one had this, the best flavor. So I don't know if it's more true because the other ones were different strains. Right. So I don't know if those are truer to their strains, but this one had the best flavor um, and it felt the least harsh on my throat. Maybe that's just because of the size of the dab I did, but it tastes more like flour to me, like when I'm smoking flour, nice. but just more of a taste in my mouth. Well, our favorite thing to hear is that it wasn't harsh on my throat. Fitz, thank you so much for the rosin dabs and for showing me around Pioneer Nuggets. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, thanks for coming. When I heard that rosin could be made at home with a hair straightener, the idea seemed wild. But after watching the process, its simplicity was put into perspective. After exploring many extraction methods, I find rosin to be the most natural because we never added any solvent. To me, rosin is a closer representation of the flower than the other extractions I've seen. One day, will everybody use the same extraction process? Will everybody just come to an agreement? No, just like beer and wine making, there's always gonna be multiple levels of experience and different ways and techniques that you can utilize to make that same product. So what's next for you guys? What's next for Oleum? The next thing for Oleum is actually we're gonna start producing more and more flour for our company and we're trying to find the perfect cannabis to make extractions. Okay, so all of your products now in the future hopefully are going to be grown by you, your equipment is going to be created by you, the mm -hmm. process is going to be you guys, the packaging and the shipping out is all going to be you. Yep. So what is the benefit in not having to partner with anybody else? How much will that benefit you guys? Well, so consistency is key in our industry. We want everything to be super consistent. If you get OG Kush from us this week, in three months from now, we want you to have the same terpene profile that our OG Kush had from three months prior.
The future of Evo Lab will be um, compounding. So, you know, we, we have a, a, what we say a, a deconstruction, reconstruction model where we're able to break it down like we showed you today. And we really think that the next stage of this is um, going to be putting these things back together in specific ratios and um, really start dialing in which cannabinoids, which terpenes, which terpenoids are contributing to effects. Because that insight will help you? Well, it'll help us develop products, but it'll also help the, you know, the scientific discovery. And, and the, basically where we're at as a company is not anywhere far from where academic science is. Our mission now is to literally make them pure scientific studies and to partner with academic institutes and drive the scientific research and also drive the product development. Why go with CO2 extraction when there are so many other options? Everything in the perfume world, from botanicals, and the pharmaceutical world, from extracting from plants, all relies on, on carbon dioxide. So I think that you know, sticking with that was, was just a wise move on their part. How do you guys decide what's next? Just There's uh, a few of us that sit down and we really talk about what's best. I kind of hold a place in the vape and clear world as um, really being in touch with our consumers and our patients. We need to be able to know what a patient best needs in their life. What will what is a necessary thing that they need? And a big thing in our industry is there's no accurate dosing. So that was a big kind of void in our industry, allowing people to medicate uh, with education on their side. With a vape and clear inhaler, you can. Based on where we are now then, where could you see us going in the future, or where do you hope that extraction and cannabis in general would, would go? I would say that I'm really hoping for a national legalization, allowing us to really bring medicine to everybody. And long term, even globally, uh, we want to be able to bring medicine to the world. I mean, at this point, the U.S. is the leading front on the mass of cannabis culture. And I think if we keep doing that, we're on the right track. You guys seem to be very open to change and moving forward and growing all the time. What do you see for the company in the future? Where would you like to go? For now, the short term, near term, is to expand our production. Um, plenty of room for us to grow in Washington State. The way I look at it is the more flexible we are about the future, the more opportunity we'll have. Some of the best moments of my life have involved cannabis, and uh, hopefully we can create a socially responsible consumer base and environment and industry that uh, provides tax money to support really good efforts while uh, the consumers of the product represent you know, a really good, healthy part of our society.